Hello everyone. Welcome to the talk series of the exhibition, the Hong Kong Jockey Club series, The Road to the Baroque, Masterpieces from the Capodimonte Museum. I'm Caroline, Assistant Curator of the International Programs at Hong Kong Museum of Art. Exclusively sponsored by the Hong Kong Jockey Club, the Road to the Baroque exhibition showcases some of the most important Baroque paintings from the Capodimonte Museum in Naples, Italy. Today's program will be divided into two sessions, followed by a Q&A session at the end. For our online audiences, please feel free to leave your questions in the comment box on Facebook and we'll read them out at the end of today's program. For today's first session, it is our honor to have invited Dr. Isabel Frank, consulting curator of the Indra and Harry Banga Gallery of the City University of Hong Kong to be our first guest speaker. She will start the session by looking into the depiction of emotions in Italian Baroque. May I now invite Dr. Isabel Frank to come on stage, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having invited me at this wonderful occasion and a fantastic exhibition. So congratulations um, to the whole staff at the Hong Kong Museum of Art and Amy uh, and Caroline for having um, done this. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today as mentioned, are emotions. And emotions are obviously very, very important in art. But the development of emotions and the way when they really uh, emerge for the first time is in Italian uh, religious medieval art. Originally, as you can see at the Master of Bigallo crucifix, Christ, even on the cross, remains serene. He is the God, he is the king in majesty, though not shown in majesty, but his attitude is one of complete indifference. He is above pain, he is an immortal, and he is, in fact, Christ as God. Now, at around the same time um, as the first image you see, you have a very different kind of presentation. Uh, which did in fact come from Byzantine painting, from earlier paintings, which showed the human side of Christ. And it was very important uh, in theology at that time to start to explore the, that human side. What it meant was that Christ was suffering. He was suffering for us and he sacrificed himself for us. His salvation at the end, his resurrection, marks that he is God, but before then, he is going through human sufferings, the passion, in order to save all of humankind. And this is what we see with that depiction. You see the bent head, um, you see a more emaciated body, sagging, actually dead. And if you look at the images, the very small depictions of the um, Virgin and St. John the Evangelist. So here, and then here. The, in the first one, they are pointing him out. They are saying, look, see what he is doing. In the second, they are mourning. And the panels next to it are also showing the actual scenes of the passion, the sadness, the tragedy, the human sorrow of somebody being uh, martyred and being hung on a cross and then taken down from it. The most famous depiction of this uh, must be Giotto's stupendous lamentation, part of a series of panels, a whole narration of Christ and the Virgin's life in the Scrobeni Chapel in Padua of 1305. And this iconic depiction uh, presents the human tragedy. This is a mother who has lost her son. He is lying there. She is bringing her face close to his, peering into it intently. Um, there, her eyes, the, the, the ways of depicting her sadness are these sort of slit black eyes that you can see. Oops, no, I didn't mean to do that. So you, you see the eyes there of St. John the Evangelist here the mouth again, this black slit. 
and the arms outstretched of St. John the Evangelist depicting his dismay. Some people are wringing their hands like this, um, others are clutching them. So the whole scene is one of mourning. But then look up above uh, at the angels. They are even more distraught. And what they're doing is actually scratching their cheeks, pulling out their hair, wringing their hands. These are traditional scenes of female mourning. And here I think what we see is a separation between what is considered appropriate for uh, the sacred figures to as not, so as not to distort their faces too much, and what the little angels, the little putti are sort of allowed to do. So there he can show the extreme amount of anguish. Now, if we jump forward to the mid 15th century with Donatello, you see that same extreme anguish almost a desperate, violent grief that is being expressed in this. It's a very small devotional panel. So part of it, I think, is that this is allowed, or Donatello, um, though he is somebody who really pushes the margins, um, shows this incredible expressive expressivity because it is a small piece, uh, something that you could have at home and that you would pray to. But it's an incredible uh, depiction with the women silhouetted. It's pierced, uh, very low relief, and uh, the pieta in front with the body of Christ that is uh, laying against the mother who is looking down again. And above her, the woman pulling her hair, another one stretching out her arms, and the whole bodies are showing the intensity of their grief. At the same time as Donatello was doing this, you have the first uh, theoreticians of arts, people like Leon Battista Alberti, writing about the power of art, writing about the importance of the artist. And in talking about emotions, he says very tellingly, nature provides that we mourn with the mourners, laugh with those who laugh, and grieve with the grief stricken. Yet these feelings are known from movements of the body. And that is empathy. And that is uh, precisely what the Renaissance theologians were talking about when they were talking about the human side of Christ's passion. They wanted to provoke the audience, the listeners to sermons, those who would see religious art to be moved by what Christ had done for us. And that is what Alberti is saying, is that we are going to identify as humans and we can't help but react. So that is the power of art to move us. And that is, in a way, the foundation of art's power uh, throughout history. But at the same time, the challenge for these artists is that in the 15th century, they didn't quite yet master the skill how to depict somebody crying. Can you really make sure that they're not laughing or somebody's going to think that they're laughing instead? And as he famously says, who would ever believe who has not tried it, how difficult it is to attempt to paint a laughing face only to have it elude you so that you make it more weeping than happy. The solution to this was soon to come, and it came from northern painters who were working in oil, Flemish painters when I say northern, and who introduced the actual depiction of tears. And this might seem like a very small uh, change, but it actually was quite important, even dramatic in the history of painting, because tears will signal grief. You do not have to distort the face. You don't have to worry about the mouth being uh, down or being a black slit. The tears are there, and they are showing you that these people are sad. And we, of course, empathize with tears and identify with them. In Mantegna's very famous Dead Christ and Three Mourners, you can see his use of tears um, influenced by northern Flemish paintings that were circulating in Italy uh, and had a great influence um, from the mid-15th century on. So their little tear is very hard to see right here. The Virgin tears there, and the third figure is there just with the mouth open. Now, of course, the whole presentation of the body 
is also incredibly dramatic. So the foreshortening, so you see the feet, you see the holes, the torn flesh, all of that, uh, the, the body that has been tortured and the sacrifice, of course, of Christ. But the tears and the handkerchief to the eyes is a kind of shortcut to tell us, yes, these people are mourning and are grieving. At the same time, or like 20 years earlier than the Mantegna, you have uh, these fantastic, these are full life statues in terracotta that show you the lamentation. And so you have to imagine yourself encountering these, perhaps without that barrier, almost being able to walk in and next to these mourning figures who are like Donatello's, and this is an artist influenced by Donatello, showing that excessive grief. And so here you have, instead of the restraint we saw with Mantegna and the tears, you have the mouths wide open. You have almost an impossible kind of magnetic force that is emanating from Christ's body in the center, pushing the woman on the right, um, almost you know, blowing their garments in an impossible way as they sort of billow out behind. The women, the Virgin Mary, which, who is the one standing, this is the Virgin Mary, um, you know, holding her hands, pressing them together, uh, bending over in her grief. And this, she looks almost as if she's terrified, petrified, wants to keep this, this horrific sight at bay and bending, pushing her knees. And the only people who are not convulsed in grief are the men. And there is a, a whole gender distinction that occurs at this time also in, in terms of mourning and the suitable nature of mourning. The figure here is dressed in contemporary garb. He is the bridge between the viewer. And the whole import of this is for the viewer to identify and through that grief to be in touch with their own grief and their own sorrow and then that leads them to remorse and contrition and that is the path to salvation so once you identify with christ and with the virgin's pain and you start to feel your own guilt um, for what you've done and realizing what christ has done for you that opens the doors, in a sense, to salvation and leads you on the road to uh, eternal salvation. The problem is that this kind of excessive grief um, could, on the one hand, distort the figures, as we've mentioned, make them ugly, uh, you don't want to represent the Virgin Mary with her mouth wide open when you can see her teeth and her tongue, you know, her face distorted by these cries. And theologians started saying, but well, wait a minute, you know, there is uh, the resurrection and this is something that has saved humanity. We can't have excessive grief at Christ's death. This is all part of the great plan. And this is something that is very problematic if all you're showing is the sacrifice and not showing the triumph of faith and the triumph of salvation that follows the passion. So slowly these kinds of depictions fell out of favor. Uh, they were uh, criticized by later artists. And if we jump forward and jump here to a wonderful um, painting, the copy by um, Marcello Venusti of The Last Judgment, which is in the exhibition, you're in, of course, a different world. This is a century later. And what is striking about Michelangelo's de depiction is the uh, desire now to show the artistry, to show the artist's ability to do uh, many things. This is now a century after Alberti. There are no technical problems or technical challenges in terms of what you're able to paint, what you're able to sculpt. And Michelangelo's Last Judgment famously was um, a kind of school for all the artists who would come and study all of his representations. And in The Last Judgment, what 
one is first struck by, I think, are these groups of sort of entangled bodies, the incredible variety and diversity of positions. He's showing a whole vocabulary of muscular bodies. At the same time, uh, if you look closely, and the two close-ups are from the, the actual fresco, uh, clean versions, where you can see the, the very bright colors. You know, the faces, even of the damned, are not, um, you know, crying out in pain or particularly horrified. Perhaps the most one sees is this figure covering his face in agony. But, you know, these are all the ones being sent down. These are the saved. They don't either have any particular expressions. What is most important is the movement, the clusters, this incredible composition, which is, makes it almost difficult to read the painting so that there is so much going on that you cannot distinguish and sort of separate one figure from the other. Right around the same time, um, sort of in the first uh, early part of the 16th century, as you heard a few weeks ago uh, when Dr. Angelo del Conte was talking, you have uh, a revolution that's occurring in the Catholic faith. Faith, And with the advent of Protestantism, the schism that occurs transforms, of course, the European countries and the Catholic faith and also art. The Protestant Reformation would took aim at art. It was sort of a small part of, of their grievances, of course, against Catholicism. But what they accused the Catholics of doing um, was of praying to painted images of idolatry. That is, of praying, mistaking the painted figure, the sculpted figure, for the sacred being. And the Catholic Church, which had, of course, many problems and had been trying to reform itself unsuccessfully uh, for several centuries, realized they had to, of course, combat this, what they saw as a heresy. And we have the Catholic Counter-Reformation. With that, uh, there were rules that were set out at the Council of Trent, huge meetings about what was proper to paint. And again, only a small part focused on art, but the part that did uh, made very clear that art should convey a very simple, clear theological message. It should move the faithful, but it should be simple. And what occurs is, in a sense, a reaction against Michelangelo, who represents the most complicated, um, the most varied form of artistic practice. And the starkest contrast is Caravaggio, so the beginning of the Baroque, who introduces you know, a dramatically different style that in many ways corresponds to what the Catholic Church was calling for you know, 60 years before in the 1530s and 40s. And of course, it took a long time for the principles of the Council of Trent to trickle down and to be applied by the artists. So in this deposition, you have the, the sorrow, you have the grief, but it is one that is already being sublimated, shall we say. So you have Mary Magdalene raising her hands uh, in this incredible triangular or pyramidal composition, but she's looking up to God and the light seems to be coming up from the heavens. So she is not mourning, tearing her hair out. Instead, it's a kind of acceptance and acknowledgement that this is part of the divine plan. The whole composition is reduced to four or five people. Uh, it's a theatrical setting. You have almost a stage-like presentation with the black surrounding it and the spotlight effect. So you have drama, but without that kind of heart-wrenching grief that we saw depicted uh, by Niccolo dell'Arca, for instance. But you still have the mastery and the display of artistic technique and skill. So just as Michelangelo was showing us, 
you know, his ability. You have Caravaggio showing you in the depiction of Christ's body, you know, an amazingly well-painted, sculpted, modeled form here with the muscles, you know, with the ribs showing. But the faces are still. They are grave. They are sad. But they are not uh, distorted by shouts and by cries. Caravaggio had a tremendous influence uh, throughout Italy, of course, starting in Naples. And two paintings um, that we are going to look at draw on his Judith and Holofernes, which is another example of a sort of wonderful Baroque composition. So here the action is right in mid-action. You could not be more in the center of what is happening. Judith has her sword halfway through Holofernes head. Now the story is that um, Judith's um, country was being invaded by Holofernes. She decided to sacrifice herself and to go and seduce him. And then during their, their night when he was asleep um, after uh, lovemaking to cut his head off. Um, and there she's shown in the act with her servant next to her. And here the drama is that climax. And the Baroque will often pick the moment the mo of highest intensity and of greatest climax. But again, look at the theatrical staging. It's close up. There is no space in back. You know, the red curtain, which sort of almost is his blood, uh, the shining light, again, the spotlight that one sees coming from the upper left and shining on his body, on Holofernes' body, again with this wonderful display of muscles, of uh, shadow and light, of his twisting in pain. And his face is distorted. He is the evil person. You know, we can do whatever we want with his face and not worry about undermining the sort of status, the sacred status of his person. But Judith is completely calm. You have the serenity. You have her being completely intent in her role um, as savior of her people, you know, bathed in white. Again, the colors, the color palette is reduced. If you think back to Michelangelo's, you know, you have browns, you have this sort of earth red, yellow and whites. In the exhibition um, that you have just seen or will see, there are two fantastic examples of the same scene. So on the one hand, you have Matteo Preti, and on the other, Artemisia Gentileschi. Matteo Preti is showing you or at least, actually, both of them are showing you the moment after. In both, Holofernes is dead. But Matteo Preti is showing you the corpse collapsed across the bed. Again, this very dramatic presentation, almost sort of in your face, the truncated neck, the arms splayed, um, the beautiful body that Preti has painted. And going back in one diagonal, and then you have Judith in the other diagonal, sort of creating a cross. And she is looking out and up to heavens. So there she is, in a sense, again, appealing to the, the heavens. The light is divine light, perhaps, coming down. She has accomplished her mission and is uh, transcendent in her sort of ecstasy of having achieved what she wanted for her people. Look at the colors again, just blue, the, the sort of saturated blue, saturated orange, the curtains, just like the ones that Caravaggio uses, that creates this drama, again, of theatricality around this composition of you know, two, maybe three people with a nurse. Now, Artemisia Dentileschi, a very famous woman, very rare woman painter of the Baroque period, is showing you a very different moment. Holofernes is almost absent. You just see his head being rolled up um, by the servant at the feet. And it is more of a, a terrestrial moment than a, a divine one. Judith is looking out, but making sure that they can escape. And the light is a natural one coming from the candle that she has her hand up against. 
uh, to pr so that she can look out and make sure. And with one hand gesturing to her helper, uh, perhaps to wait for a second or to hurry up. But there, with that very simple diagonal and with that light, you have the whole drama of the uh, excitement and drama of escape. Are they going to make it? Are they going to be caught? And that's, again, the height, the climax of the, uh, the tension that is captured just with these two figures, uh, very much, of course, influenced by Caravaggio. As you can see, again, the colors of just red, orange, white, and that amazing light. The influence uh, spreads, of course, and or is diffused throughout Naples and, and throughout Italy. This is another painting uh, in the gallery, in the exhibition upstairs, showing you the Massacre of the Innocents by Massimo Stanzione. And what is different here is that often the Massacre of the Innocents is shown, sort of a horrific scene uh, with many, many soldiers, you know, dozens of soldiers, dozens of women and dozens of babies either dead or being torn from their mothers. So you have this whole scene populated by a lot of figures. What the Baroque does, of course, is focus on the individual. And it's again creating that intimate link, the empathy we talked about that Alberti recognized. That by focusing on one, the, the horror and the tragedy of one woman, like the Virgin Mary uh, losing her son, you have that connection that is made, the human connection. And so here Massimo Stanzione has pared it down to really one figure shown almost with a gray face as if she were being uh, killed or dead, holding her baby and the face of the soldier lunging. And in the foreground, creating this dramatic triangle or, tri or let's say diagonal and cross composition, you have a soldier leaning over and grabbing a baby from another woman. But the fact that this woman, you don't see her face, and she's pushing you, of course, with the line of this figure also against the light to focus in the back on this drama that is happening. So it's an incredibly clever composition where you're not in a way distracted by the sorrow and the horror and the anguish of this woman, but the whole force and thrust of the composition is pushing you backwards while you feel the anguish of both. And again, the same colors, this, these saturated palettes of the earth tones uh, with the white breaking in. These gestures, you know, that are very dramatic now from Caravaggio with the hands lifted, uh, with the arm lifted here to kill, that the Baroque painters focus on to tell you the action, were also getting codified and were being diffused in many different ways. Um, throughout Europe. The most famous way that this was happening was through a book that uh, Cesare Ripa put together first in the 1590s to give artists and emblem makers um, a set of standardized you know, emblems, shortcuts that would mean very many different things and even could have complex meanings that could be shown then with one simple figure. The new iconology, as it was called, was translated into many European languages. You know, went through, I don't know how many editions, over two centuries. And here I'm showing you uh, two pages from two different editions, uh, 1603 on the right and 1611 just to give you a sense of the kinds of representations that you can find. So compunction um, is really a feeling of guilt, remorse, of shame. And what you see is a heart with a crown of thorns around it, so reference to Christ's crown of thorns, and the woman pointing up to heaven, so feeling the weight um, of the heavenly guilt uh, and remorse in the face of uh, God. And on the right, humility. 
So there, a gesture that almost has become iconic. You know, you think of um, crossing your arms on your breasts, bowing, receiving, accepting what is being told to you. These are two other images uh, just to show you love towards God in two different versions, you know, more than a hundred years apart. And the first one, you know, pointing to your heart and connecting your heart to God, looking up. Uh, the other one quite similar with a hand down then. And the shorthand symbols to express emotions uh, were then used, you know, throughout prints and paintings, of course. Now, in the hands of a great painter, these gestures take on greater meaning. They have, they're loaded with true emotion. So here you have Guido Reni, uh, the saint, Rocco, again in the exhibition, where there is nothing happening here. It is the saint who is looking up um, and pointing to his chest with sort of gesture of love of God. Now, if you know the background, all of these saints are martyrs. So basically they have, like Christ, sacrificed themselves for Catholicism. And this moment then is one of transcendence, of San Rocco accepting his fate, looking up of sublimation. So we've moved from depictions of tears and horror and pain to one of this incredible uh, transcendent joy almost, uh, bathed in divine light, almost with a halo. And the movement is created by this wonderful cloak that is sort of going around him in curls, almost those of you who know Bernini's sculptures, he'll do the same thing. He'll use the cloak and the clothing to create the drama of the moment. Now in a completely different style, I'm just showing you this one example of these, uh, what continued in the margins of, uh, still considered the margins of European painting in Italy, uh, these full life statues that recreated the passion of the cross. And you could then go and go from one station of the cross to another. And here you had uh, real instruments, real wigs used. Uh, they were full, almost three dimensional recreations that we don't know as much about as we should. And they are, were all over the Northern Alps. Um, but what happens here in the 1640s is you can see all the different figures doing these gestures that we've seen, hands raised, wringing the hands, looking up. And one might feel that in a sense, these gestures can also become slightly empty um, and become more rhetorical than actually full of that passion. And that is one of the risks that uh, Baroque art grapples with. And for many reasons, um, in some artists' hands, obviously it's more successful than others. And in art history, Baroque has had a bad reputation precisely because it's been seen as being overly dramatic, uh, perhaps as being melodramatic and that there is a lack of sincerity in the emotional expressivity. But this is certainly um, not true for the most successful artists and the way that they use uh, these very simple gestures to convey a whole world of emotions. So with Giuseppe di Ribera, uh, a Neapolitan, a originally Spanish painter, Neapolitan, working in Naples. You have, again, the sublimation of his pain. Uh, he was shot by arrows, which didn't kill him. He was actually saved. Um, but here he is immune to pain. He is, a trans he is uh, looking up to heaven, um, already seeing his salvation at the end of time, uh, and the body is bathed in a white light, showing Ribera's artistry, showing his ability to paint the body. But notice now, it's no longer that muscular 
tone that we saw with Caravaggio. This is now a kind of normal man, probably, who would have been the model for this. Um, an individual with his hair, with his defects. It's not as idealized. Mattia Preti, in his St. John the Baptist, um, again is in, in a sense, showing us a composition where it is the composition that is the meaning of the painting. There is, again, nothing going on. It is, in a sense, a portrait of St. John the Baptist, who is in uh, a wonderful, slightly convoluted pose, sort of pivoting on this stone, pointing upwards, uh, his cross pointing upwards, his symbol, the lamb, at his feet, and everything moving up again to God in this moment of ecstasy, moment of uplifting and transcendence. Um, again, of course, a martyr whose head was um, cut off. Perhaps the height of this um, in the exhibition that we see is, is really embodied in Francesco Guarino's St. Agatha. And St. Agatha was martyred by having her breasts cut off. Now, you wouldn't know this um, if you looked at this painting. What you see is a woman who looks almost sort of supremely indifferent. You know, it's this incredible face looking out at you, almost the eyebrows slightly raised. And she is pointing very, very elegantly to her chest where she holds a big uh, white cloth then, and you realize it's against her wound and there's some blood there. Um, but she is sort of almost posing for a portrait. And it's this, uh, the composition is even that of a portrait with that kind of pyramid, this like twisting that occurs in three quarter portraits. And these, again, wonderfully elegant hands. So here it is the martyrdom almost fading away, um, becoming a minor inconvenience for this you know, beautiful portrayal of the saint. Uh, with her fantastic sort of alabaster skin, and again, the spotlight, and again, these very simple tones of brown and white. Bernardo Cavallino, in his Saint uh, Cecilia in Ecstasy, provides a, another example of this, where you have the, uh, the saint uh, who is martyred now sort of levitating up uh, she's not actually sitting on anything, about to receive her crown of martyrdom, the crown of martyrdom being one uh, sort of paralleling the crown of thorns of Christ. And the whole movement is of this upward transcendence, so the actual being lifted up into the heavens as she receives her sort of divine rewards. She was the saint of, of music. Her violin is below her and the angel is playing in the background. And you almost have a sense because of the curtain and back that she has these huge white wings on either side of her. The secular parallel to this you can also see upstairs in this fantastic Apollo and Marcius. Now, what's interesting here is that you can see again um, how these principles apply differently to different characters. So Marcius, who had the audacity to challenge Apollo to a musical competition, who lost, obviously, um, is shown being punished. The punishment was to be flayed alive. And his mouth is open in horror, distorted, screaming in anguish. And you can see in back his companions now reverting to exactly the same positions, the same gestures we saw Giotto's little angels doing, right? the scratching of the face um, in horror. So these are completely suitable uh, and correct for mythological characters, especially ones who have made mistakes, while Apollo uh, sort of hovers serenely above this, almost weightless. We don't really know what he's kneeling on. His cloak gathering around him, almost lifting him up as he's flaying um, Marcius, but a, a real complete sort of Apollonian disdain for what is going on. And uh, quickly to show you the, the codification that continued with these kinds of gestures from the Baroque were also coming from rhetoric and from 
acting. So the manuals for professionals were being written in this time, whether you wanted to be, you were an aspiring courtier and wanted to know how to behave, wanted to know table manners. If you wanted to perfect your way of being a rhetorician, um, these were the gestures that you should use when you were making a speech to symbolize different things. And John Bulver, for instance, here is showing you the same uh, gesture, one that we've been seeing now over the past uh, 40 minutes of, you know, imploration, showing grief, showing sorrow, um, weeping and tears. And so this codification of gestures um, made them available to everybody to a certain extent. Um, and they could be used, as I said, they could be misused as shortcuts um, but when used properly here with Bernardo Cavallino, you can see in his secular painting of the singer, so a very early sort of Jean painting, not mythological and not religious, who is shown with the, the same kind of ecstatic expression as the Saint Cecilia, both sort of with, high, with a, the, the strong light highlighting their face, um, both sort of transported, one by religious ecstasy, the other by music, and with the fingers of the musician sort of beautifully gesturing, signaling in a sense, um, her being transported. And of course, St. Cecilia is open to God, to acceptance of martyrdom, and of course, joy at um, her salvation. If one jumps two centuries later, uh, one can see the use of gestures that have become commonplace and that are even uh, made fun of. So this is a wonderful painting showing the effect of melodrama from the uh, early 19th century. Now this is obviously showing some women and her companions who went to see a French play, a melodrama, that would have been full of reversals of fortune, of dramatic moments, of crises, of innocent suffering. And the reactions um, that you would have seen, that you see this lady having, fainting, is going to mimic what she would have seen on stage, of you know, ladies fainting, almost being kidnapped, being saved, etc. But the position and the composition is almost one of the swooning virgin uh, who is being saved and surrounded. And so, although one can make fun of this by the 19th century, of gestures that take on a life of their own, uh, what one has to thank the Baroque period for is that they were the ones who were able to create a new way to communicate pain, religious fervor, love, and horror while remaining within the accepted aesthetic constraints of their period. And their accomplishment is clear because they went on to influence artistic and theatrical cinematic vocabulary for the following centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for the very insightful presentation on Baroque emotions. Uh, Dr. Frank, please kindly take a seat downstairs first. Um, next up, may I introduce our speaker for the second half of today's session, Dr. Sim Himen Wen, lecturer of the Department of Art History of the University of Hong Kong. In his presentation, he will talk about the theatricality of still life paintings, a genre which allowed Baroque masters such as Caravaggio to achieve the best possible representation of reality through technical virtuosity. Dr. Wen, please. I would like to begin by thanking the Hong Kong Museum of Art uh, and the curatorial team that organized this talk series for the current exhibition of masterpieces from Capo di Monte. It is a tremendous honor to join Dr. Frank, this afternoon in our conversation of the Baroque period as an impressive one that continues to captivate us after four centuries. 
Dr. Frank, thank you for a very insightful and informative presentation. I especially enjoy the discussion of Christian drama without any uh, unsightly distortion. Now I shall talk about the drama of still life painting and how Baroque Italy was connected to the rest of 17th century Europe. Not being able to travel during the pandemic, I was absolutely thrilled to see from the comfort of my home city some of the most seductive works in art history, like the two examples we see here, St. Agatha by Francesco Guarino and St. Sebastian by Giuseppe de Rivera. As we saw earlier in Dr. Frank's presentation, now the exhibition offers all the theatricality, dynamism and stimulants that one would expect from Baroque Italy. Apollo flaying Marcius, Cain murdering Abel, Judith decapitating Holofernes, and King Herod massacring the innocent are reenacted to us in high contrast stage lighting. These scenes feature bodies and actions in a manner that destabilizes the Renaissance strife for compositional order, clarity, and ideals. Dramatic portrayals of biblical episodes, ancient myths, and historical events mixing techniques of naturalism and a taste for fantasies were found throughout Catholic Europe during the 17th century. The imaginative Peter Paul Rubens from Flanders and the experimental Diego Balazquez from Spain would not be the historical uh, celebrities, specifically the art historical celebrities that they are, if they did not practice in Italy. While we tend to regard the Italian peninsula as early modern Europe's artistic center, this region is not generally associated with two genres of painting that took the continent by storm. I'm referring to landscape and still life paintings, which the exhibition includes as objects of the Neapolitan Baroque. Italian landscape masters with the Venetian uh, Canaletto and Giambattista Piranesi as the most recognizable names did not emerge until the 18th century. The still life pictures from Capo di Monte shown upstairs date to the second half of the 17th century. Here is one example from the exhibition with the display of kitchen items as a common motif. And here is a bouquet motif, also common. By the first few decades of the 17th century, artists in the Netherlands and Spain have already established a highly lucrative international market for the still life genre. On the surface, the arrangement of food and household objects in the studio setting is an exercise for painters to study shapes, textures, and lighting as skills of photorealism that they could apply in fanciful compositions. These images appear secular rather than religious, mundane rather than extraordinary, and unassuming rather than ostentatious. But is this truly the case? The aim of this presentation is to understand how these works express the opulence of trade and the continuous significance of Christian iconography in a markedly transforming early modern Europe. Instead of the overt drama of bodies experiencing violence and recounting legends, the static and composed scenes of still life paintings are dramatic in their own right. Let's begin our exploration of this idea with the renowned example of Northern mannerism from the mid 16th century. Peter Ertzeff is from Amsterdam and rose to prominence in Antwerp before the Dutch revolt when the Northern Netherlands declared independence from Habsburg, Spain. Antwerp, the largest urban center in Flanders and still the largest city proper in Belgium today, with 500,000 inhabitants reported in 2020, was 16th century Europe's global entrepôt. Goods from Asia, Africa, and the Americas brought by Portuguese ships poured into the city. As a bustling port that also made its fortunes, from the paint printing industry, Antwerp was the northern European center of art that rivaled Italy and specifically Venice in the south. For most, Atlas's meat store is quite an unsettling image 
of uh, cannibalism with the severed head of an ox and one of his eyes gazing back at the viewer. There is a slaughter animal carcass hung on the left. Lifeless fowls, a swine's snout, draping awful, piles of hooves and other meat products fill the foreground. Without looking at the title, one may mistake this as the preparation for which is Sabbath. The sight of death and dismemberment may conjure up the horror of the inferno, or you may simply think of Hong Kong's wet market. What this meat store represents is extravagance, carnal pleasures, and the carnival before Lent. You see the two herrings above the ox's head and the two pretzels? Uh, here we are, herrings and pretzels. Uh, these, are the, um, these are the symbols of Lenten fasting, for they are the acceptable types of meat and bread that the Catholics of the Netherlands consume for 40 days before Easter. In the background to the left, the barn opens to a scene of Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child fleeing to Egypt, as the Dutch title indicates. The Holy Family is giving alms to the poor, as the English title indicates. In the background on the right, the barn is attached to a farmhouse, where a family is gathering around a fine meal, presumably with the food being prepared in the foreground. In case you cannot see clearly, here are the enlarged versions of the inserted scenes. A detail in front of the farmhouse on the right is the scattering of oyster shells on the ground to symbolize earthly enjoyments, for oysters were considered an aphrodisiac. Just as carnival is juxtaposed with Lent in the foreground, poverty and charity are juxtaposed with abundance and squandering in the background. Art historians not generally categorize Atchison Meat Store as a still life painting. Nevertheless, this mid-16th century work conveys how the innovative display of domestic objects in early modern European art is rooted in the tradition of Christian mot motifs. When we look at the Italians painting butcher shops later in the 16th century, such as Bartolomeo Pasterotti and Annibale Caracci, the influence of Asher is evident. The depiction of animals torn open for human consumption probably remain a commentary on the virtue of moderation versus the vice of excess for Pazzarotti and Caracci. But the motivation for these paintings was not exclusively religious. Their attention to an event as quotidian as working in a butcher shop or visiting a butcher shop is a mark of the skillfulness in naturalism. Karachi's bean eater shows a peasant in the middle of a simple meal, consisting of beans, crusty bread, spring onions, cured fish, and a flagon of wine. One may certainly connect the bread, the fish, and the wine from mir uh, with the miracles of Christ. Yet, it is unde undeniable that the painting's focus is on the peasant and his meal. If Karachi is inviting the viewer to contemplate the moral of frugality and the reward of submitting to the church, he's doing so by exercising a level of naturalism that draws the viewer into the scene. Karachi does not only gesture at the presence of humble food items, he's almost tilting the table service towards us and highlighting the dishes as separate objects with on a pristine white tablecloth. A side note while we're discussing Karachi, um, two of his paintings are exhibited upstairs. Uh, the two male nudes are in the same room as uh, Titian, uh, Pamigianino, and uh, Bronzino. At the turn of the 17th century, artists in Italy were rather lukewarm on the production of still life paintings. Caravaggio painted many fruit baskets and bouquet in a studio setting, but he was more the exception than the rule. The Protestant Dutch were far more interested in this genre. It was a very Calvinist way of flaunting the material abundance they were acquiring beyond the borders of the small republic. 
as a prolific Dutch still life painter, Peter Klaasjoen, or Peter Klaas for short, shows us in this image of a modest spread. Foreign goods are balanced with domestic ones. Luxury is balanced with restraint, and drama is balanced with composture. The Calvinist Dutch managed to become globetrotters who brought Asia, Africa, and the Americas to Europe through imported products, but they were uneasy with wealth. Still life paintings were a means to capture and remember the finer moments, as though all the fortunes and supplies would slip from their hands eventually, like youth and beauty. For the Dutch, the value of painting food, flowers, and such perishable items is the reminder of time, decay, and ephemerality. Vanitas and momentum mori go, go together. Related to the English word vanity, the Latin word vanitas links attractiveness to worthlessness. Momentum mori, another Latin term, is a reminder of death as everyone's fate. In Italy, still life is called natura morta, literally dead nature, to highlight the concept of mortality while referring to inanimate objects. The Italians were no strangers to images suggestive of vitality and demise at the same time. Yet, with the Counter-Reformation as a dominant force, the sensational portrayal of Catholic saints and other biblical characters eclipsed the more subtle visual message of mortality's inevitability and the attainment of immortality through piety. The Protestant Dutch, as founders of a new republic and amid building a global trade company, were more eager to represent wealth and sumptuous objects as warning on indulgence. In Clash's Still Life with a Turkey Pie, there is no ambiguity that the centerpiece is a turkey pie. However, it is less clear whether the pie is beneath the decorative wild bird or uh, the pastry cut open on a platter. Turkeys are native to North America, and this display of turkey dish is a celebration of the Dutch Republic's access to a novel food source. On the same buffet table as the pie are a number of domestic and foreign items. Grapes from Southern Europe and local apples are placed in a shallow white bowl with blue patterns that must be Chinese porcelain. Next to this is a Dutch manufacturer's nautilus cup made with gold and a whole nautilus shell to underscore the Dutch Republic as a maritime culture of traders. Echoing the nautilus is a platter of oysters native to the country's tidal shoreline. It is served with a generous helping of ground peppercorns imported from Indonesia, which were a costly rarity at the time. Peeled and sliced lemons from Spain are rendered with such photorealism that one can almost smell the citrus oil and taste the acidic pulps. The same can be said about the cracked walnuts and bread loaves scattered on the table. One can almost hear the cracking sound as one gazes at the bits of shells and the golden crust separating from the soft, chewy center. Behind the pie are a dish of olives and a glass of white wine from the Mediterranean. The wine is poured from a tall, curvaceous, and well-polished Ottoman flagon made of South American silver. Covering the table are Dutch white linen and Ottoman uh, damask fabric. These represent the lucrative textile industry in the Netherlands, as well as the profits generated to purchase another globally traded and status-boosting product for the home from Asia. Dutch delight paintings do not typically contain landscapes or human figures in the background. Objects of vanitas and momento mori, such as the flamboyant nautilus cup and the fresh food that was soon spoiled, are arranged to be a convincing scene rather than a random collection of things alluding to ideas beyond the picture. In this scene, Dutch delight paintings are composed to be are, in, uh, are composed to be enjoyed for their illusionistic appeal before they're read for their detective function. Clash's inclusion of optical details is key evidence. 
Aside from the Nautilus Cup's skillfully rendered iridescence and the linen soft sheen, the silver flagon and the wine glass are carefully finished with reflections of the immediate surroundings. Refractions of the light sources are appropriate for the materials, surface curvatures, and transparency. If you look carefully at the reflection on the flagon and the glass, you get a glimpse of the room in which the painting was made. Although the stillness of still light paintings implies the opposite of action and excitement, a clashish attention of to optics is a literal spectacle that engages the eye. For those of you who are familiar with 15th century and 16th century Renaissance art in the Netherlands, you probably remember Jan van Eyck and Quinte Mechais' clever employment of mirrors to expand pictorial space. With the reflective flagon and wine glass, Klaasje is essentially referencing his predecessors in the Netherlands and asserting a northern tradition of perfecting two-dimensional photorealism as opposed to the perfection of linear perspective emanating from Italy. What we're looking at here then is neither a documentation of Dutch middle-class dining table nor an arrangement of studio props for a painter to study objects in space. This is a stage on which ordinary and novel household items deliver a performance of Dutch nationalism. Still life painters in the newly established Dutch Republic put on spectacles with local items that embody the Dutch identity, as well as foreign items that trumpeted the expansion of Dutch power worldwide. Tulips appeared in paintings not only to commemorate the Dutch cultivation of this plant from the Ottoman Empire with tremendous success and profitability, but also to express the Dutch Republic's scientific preoccupation with observing and understanding nature. As seen here in Ambrosius Boschka's Still Life with Flowers, the placement of flowers in a vase allows the artist to represent each flower, uh, each flower type, from different angles and at different blooming stages. The result is a single frame that suggests the viewer's movement around the flower and the prolonged experience of the bouquet. This defines our modern conception of a picture as an instant capture from a fixed perspective. In other words, a still life painting is by no means static. The appeal of flowers and their spectacular quality is not something that needs explaining. It is also evident to most of us why flowers are seen as objects of vanitas and momento mori. Flowers budding, blooming, and wilting remind us that youth and beauty are transient, and death is inevitable. In this still life by Boschkart, the butterfly on the left is a further reminder of metamorphosis and change, rather than stability and permanence. The Ming Chinese vase with floral ornamentations holding actual flowers presents a contrast of real versus simulated, variable versus constant, and fragility versus durability that emphasizes time and its power over us. Like the still life paintings of table spreads, images of bouquets are artifacts of nationalism. Here we have Dutch tulips juxtaposed with a Chinese vase which were both items of luxury associated with the Dutch middle class and expressive of the Republic's prosperity. Although Dutch still life paintings feature domestic objects, they did not usually convey the perspective of women on domestic life. Clara Peters is an early 17th century woman artist from Antwerp who was active in both the Protestant North uh, and the, the Catholic Southern Netherlands. In her still life with fish and the candles, Peters makes several references of early modern women's private and public roles that move away from signifiers of Dutch nationalism, capitalism, and expansionism. Fish is known in the Christian world through time as a symbol of Christ and in the classical tradition as a symbol of the element water. However, more specific to 17th century society, Piles of fish, crabs, and prawns for the dinner plate evoked the fish market and the rowdy fishwives that vended the spoilable goods. 
contrary to the modern generalization of pre-industrial women as domesticated and subservient to men, fishwives are an example of women running a highly demanded business and having a dominant presence in the public sphere. Concurrent with the rise of the Dutch Republic as a global trading empire, where one, uh, the Protestant government's dissolution of convents, and two, the shift towards the bourgeois nuclear family with maid servants. Both conditions led to the domestication of women. Is Paige's hinting at such a fate for contemporary women? She is, after all, an accomplished woman artist. Her inclusion of a self-portrait on the metallic lid of the Rhinish stoneware jug on the right, which was a luxurious possession, is an indication of her status. It is difficult to see, but here is her face painted as a reflection on the lid. Such realism would be mesmerizing in a world without photography. At the center of the composition, the shiny scales of the fish are echoed in the perforated copper strainer and brass skimmer. These two utilitarian kitchen objects conjure up the maidservant. By connecting the fish to the strainer and skimmer, Peters is juxtaposing the condition of working women in a public place and working women in a private place. Adding to her representation of maid serving in private homes with the kitchen utensils are the artichokes, a costly vegetable from the Mediterranean, thought to have aphrodisiac properties when consumed. As the only green and lively item among an assortment of dead and inanimate things, the artichokes are possibly a commentary on the commodification of the young maid servant in an affluent middle class household. The partly burned candle in the back is unmistakably memento mori, and the glass receptacle on the left is very likely another symbol of womanhood. In this painting, the most overt reference of gender is a female crab with his belly facing towards us. For viewers who grasp the implicit meanings, Page's still life is more than a flat picture of domestic life. It is a multi-layer spectacle of a woman artist inserting her voice in an art genre that typically conflates domesticity with patriotism and patriotism with the patriarchal glorification of territorial expansion and resource acquisition. We have now looked at several examples of early 17th century still life paintings from the Netherlands. This genre was the most popular in the Protestant Dutch Republic, but it was by no means ignored in the Catholic parts of Europe where art production was largely focused on the counter-reformation and religious imageries. In Spain, the name for still life painting is bodegon, which is related to the word bodega, meaning a tavern or an area for preparing food and drinks. Bolygon paintings depict ordinary characters and scenes, as well as objects. They are called bolygonists because the contents are seen as quotidian, unrefined, or even vulgar, like a tavern. Here I've chosen a luncheon scene by Balefquez to illustrate the type of characters and scenarios in a Spanish bolygon. A Dutch still life would only show the plate of mussels, the loaf of bread, the wine, and the pomegranates on the white table. It was acceptable for Spanish bodegon to add an entourage of common folks with candid expressions taking part in everyday activities. Paradoxically, while human figures are never seen in the Dutch still life, their presence in a bodegon stem from the Spanish stimulating uh, Dutch genre of genre painting. Images of daily lives often dramatized in a believable manner gained momentum during the Flemish Renaissance of the 16th century and continue to shape Flemish Baroque art during the 17th century. The understanding of Spanish bodegones as low art or centered on the lower classes is rather misleading. Plenty of these paintings feature foreign items to affirm Spanish imperialism. As Spain was devoted to the Counter-Reformation, bodegon painters were often compelled to include or Catholic symbolism. In this work by Francisco de Tuburant, we see a platter of lemons, a basket of uh, oranges, and a small teacup on a salsa with a rose. 
They're placed on a polished table and under such intense lighting that the basket's reflection on the table surface is visible. For the art historian Anne Sutherland Harris, the excessive amount of space between these three sets of objects likens the arrangement to an altar display. The pitch black background and glaringly illuminated objects give the scene an otherworldly other quality, suggestive of miracles in the Christian context. A more obvious reference of Christianity here is the division of the canvas into three sections, denoting the trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Citruses from a warm climate with leaves and flowers attached symbolize the Garden of Eden. The cup of water is baptism, and the rose is Virgin Mary. Without portraying Christ, Adam, Eve, the Virgin, John the Baptist, or any human figures, Thubaran creates a stage in which a narrative of devotion is performed to the viewer. Thubaran is known for his frequent use of a black background following uh, Juan Sánchez uh, Cotán and stage lighting rem reminiscent of Caravaggio's work. In this still life with a bowl of chocolate, he emulates the Dutch by painting items expressive of Europe's contact with Asia and the Americas. Imported from Mesoamerica, chocolate was consumed in the 17th century by wealthy and fashionable Europeans as a stimulating beverage made palatable with sugar, similar to coffee and tea. Beneath the bowl of chocolate in this painting is a platter composed of silver, a material from South America and widely traded within the Spanish Empire worldwide. While the title of this painting is focused on the chocolate, we also see on the left a, co a copper coffee pot and a pair of Chinese porcelain teacups, referential of the Spanish Manila galle galleon trade. An Arabian jasmine flower next to the cups is another indicator of tea. On the right are small cane sugar loaf for the bitter chocolate and an indigenous clay jar imported from the New World. This jar represents yet another fashionable drink at the time, which is water, flavored, aromatized, and cooled by the clay. Supposedly, the water is therapeutic. Today, we know that the alkalinity, porosity, and insulative capacity of clay do in fact provide a mineralized, purified, and chill water. Thus, in a single picture, we have coffee from the Ottoman Empire, purchased with Spanish-American silver, chocolate native to Mesoamerica, water in a clay jar produced by indigenous Americans, and Chinese tea brought to Spain through Spanish Philippines and Mexico. These products are highly accessible to us in the 21st century. 400 years ago, Europeans were willing to pay outrageous prices. If we look at this table of coffee, tea, chocolate, and water, through the eyes of a 17th century European, we are invited to admire a spread of luxury and the spectacle of the Spanish Empire possessing all these coveted goods. I think it would help if we imagine these objects as diamond and gold studded containers of cognac, champagne, oxygen wine, and pure oxygen. The Waran still life paintings demonstrate how a seemingly un unimpressive collection of objects expresses Spain's investment in the counter-reformation and world power. Yet, this subtle uh, manner of pedestaling Catholicism and imperialism is not necessarily the convention in a Baroque Europe that relished drama and pomp. Let's uh, have a brief look at Ca um, Catholic Flanders, part of the Spanish Netherlands, before we uh, conclude the talk. Native to Dutch-speaking Flanders are the rock masters, uh, Peter Paul Rubisch and Anthony van Dijk, whose work will be shown at the Hong Kong Palace Museum next month until February. Sorry if I'm promoting for another museum, but this upcoming exhibition is very exciting news for the Hong Kong community in general. Now, the creator of this Flemish Baroque still life, contemporaneous with the Varan's bowl of chocolate, is Jan Davison de Heim. He was a Dutchman active in Flanders, the reverse situation of Clara Peters, who was a Fleming active in both the Northern and Southern Netherlands. 
In this work, we see a much more exuberant and festive approach to displaying Spanish Antwerp's wealth that aligns with broad theatricality, irregularity, and excess. As indicated by the name Bronx de Lever, the painting is a still life of Bronx, meaning showy to the extent of flamboyance in Dutch. Behind a table of plenty is a black satin curtain, are partially pulled back to reveal a landscape with ominous storm clouds and a Tuscan column suggesting an Italian architectural setting. Hailing from two continents outside Europe, the bluish African grey parrot and the scarlet macaw parrot native to Brazil give the painting its title. Although the title directs our attention to the parrot, the image is definitely focused on the magnificent spread of fresh fruit, cooked seafood and fancy containers. The pomegranate, uh, melon, and gourd on the table, along with the conches and the equally iridescent figs on the bench, bench, represent sexual appetite. Reinforcing the idea of carnal pleasures are two butterflies, symbolic of momentary beauty, and a platter of oyster, savor as aphrodisiac. This is a sight of abundance and that inundates our eyes with all of the hues imaginable, and an explosion of props without enough space to hold them properly. Expensive silver plates sit on top of one another. The bench is an extension of the lavish table, and there's even a ceramic pot on the floor. Mirroring the turbulent sky and the curtain's elaborate folds is a haphazardly placed um, damask silk fabric as a tablecloth, representative of West and East Asia. Wildness is an apparent motif here, especially with the leaves reaching out from the fruit and the tropical parrots gracing a human gathering. At the same time, the leaves and the parrots allude to paradise, such that a scene of indulgence is justified as a reward of commitment to Christianity rather than a sign of uh, sinful decadence. With understanding of Dutch, Flemish, and Spanish to light painting from the first half of the 17th century as multivalent images of wealth, power, identity, and devotion, we're now more equipped to appreciate the still life works upstairs from Capo de Monte. All the objects in the collection date to the second half of the 17th century. This painting of a lodger garden with a woman picking grapes from the end of the 17th century is by the German artist uh, Christian Brehens in the room and studio of Carlo Morata. Like Antwerp in the Spanish Netherlands, Naples under Spanish control enter a period of decline beginning in the mid 17th century after the devastating Naples plague of the 1650s. This is a lesson for Hong Kong recovering from the COVID pandemic. In Rome, around the turn of the 18th century, there was not necessarily economic prosperity that motivated the flaunting of material resources through painting. However, attributable to the Counter-Reformation, Rome's papal state covered more of the Italian peninsula than ever at this time. Instead of overt Catholic references that have become banal, this work by Berendt and Maratta Studios takes on the fashion of still life outside of Italy to position Rome as the center of Europe. A classical villa setting in the background imparts Italian traditions. The boy and the woman harvesting grapes in contemporary clothing as an active portrayal of the wine shown next to them also represent Italy. Clearly, foreign items in this scene include a turkey on the sunlit landing, the sunflowers on the right facing the light, an Ottoman rug in the foreground, and the eye-catching watermelon. As they originate from the New World, the turkey and the sunflowers are icons of Catholic Spain and Portugal. Although flowers and fruit have appeared in the still life paintings of Italian artists, such as the Roman Caravaggio, the citrus on a silver platter with its rind peeled into a ribbon is indebted to the Dutch. Overall, this work embodies a kind of Baroque theatricality that is rendered through the lighting scheme. From the illuminated pile of fruit and household objects in the foreground, our eyes move to a darker middle ground of human figures and flowers. Finally, in the background, is a sunny exterior 
with hints of mount of the mountainous terrain um, at the vanishing point. How are the examples of still life painting produced in Naples or produced by Neapolitan artists representative of Baroque theatricality? As a historically prosperous and proud city of trade in the Mediterranean before the mid 17th century, um, was Naples also interested in articulating its status through still life? I hope that this talk has provided some information and guidance for viewing the Capo di Monte still life pieces upstairs. We began with the consideration of the genre as a more minor one in Italy during the 17th century. On the contrary, paintings focused on inanimate objects were exceedingly popular in the Netherlands. By looking at Dutch still life, we have foregrounded another major artistic development in 17th century Europe that coincided with the Counter-Reformation and the Baroque in the Catholic South. For the Dutch, a simple bouquet or buffet table presented in a somber atmosphere may be a poignant spectacle. Aside from the convention of perishable luxury as a reminder of beauty's impermanence and death's impendence, the juxtaposition of domestic and foreign products constitutes a narrative of nationalism and expansionism. Such an affirmation of secular power by visual means paralleled the papacy's international program of reinforcing the Catholic faith with inspiring art commissions in the captivating Baroque expression. Examples of Spanish and Flemish still life further attest to the cross-pollination of innovations between Southern and Northern Europe. Ultimately, the current exhibition of masterpieces from Capo di Monte offers a more inclusive glimpse of the Baroque period. As a historian of Dutch visual culture from a global perspective, I must constantly grapple with the polarization of cultural production into a central camp and a peripheral camp. Thus, I am thoroughly delighted to see the inclusion of still life and landscape paintings alongside portraits of saints, scenes from the Bible, allegories of Christian virtues, and depictions of ancient myths. Thank you for coming this afternoon. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much for your sharing, Dr. Wen. And now may I also invite Dr. Isabel Frank to come back on stage for our Q&A session. Uh, for our audiences, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hands and our ambassador will pass you the mic. When I walked around the exhibition, um, something stood out for me, the theme of women uh, um, in strength, either mentally or physically uh, amongst the biblical paintings. Um, in our contemporary society, everyone is aware that there's a conscientious drive to address the balance of appreciation of the two sexes. I was just wondering in the Baroque uh, art world whether there were any deliberate desire to promote anything around this theme or subject matter. Uh, thank you for that question. It's quite interesting. Um, I would say that it was not deliberate in that manner, but that the biblical themes provided uh, an excuse to portray women so that you would need uh, in an interesting composition to have both men and women. And the portrayal of women uh, as heroines was one that, was, uh, that had a long tradition to it of virtuous women uh, sacrificing themselves, uh, or Lucretia, etc., And these had been held up as models of female behavior in the Renaissance through paintings that were uh, designed and painted for new brides to remind them, in a sense, of female virtue. But at the same time, as you point out, these are also images of very strong women. So uh, it is a double-edged uh, sword in, in one sense. That is, you are reminding women um, of uh, their virtue to protect their chastity, to be uh, faithful, etc. But at the same time, you're showing that they can be very powerful. And in the Renaissance, in the 15th century, you had a moment when women rulers 
were quite powerful, um, often ruling for their husbands who were off leading wars. Uh, this window closed in the Baroque. Um, so in a sense, the actual position of women diminished. Though as we see with Artemisia Gentileschi, um, there were women painters, or uh, Clara Peters, um, as um, you just heard. And more needs to be done to really understand the possibilities for some of these. I mean, I ran across a really interesting reference to an Italian sculptor, and it said he was being paid uh, for something he did, um, and his wife uh, helped him. That's all, you know, and you should think, oh, <laughs> you know, beneath that, there's a whole world. Dr. Frank, uh, do you have any more questions from the floor? I have one of those horrible two-part questions for both um, Dr. Frank and Dr. Wan. Um, one trend I noticed in both your seminars was the sort of very pervasive um, influence of religion um, during that period of time. Um, Dr. Frankie talked about emotions and using the Christ and the passion as a way of driving forward that study. And Dr. Wan, in a simple um, still life, it seemed like the competition between the Catholics and the Protestants was very prominent as well. Um, despite that sort of directional push of religion, do you think that overlay sort of restricted development or held back artworks of that period of time? And I guess my second question is, um, I've learned so much during this session, but I can tell that there's so much more history and knowledge and, and background that you would love to share with us. Without having your level of expertise, how would you suggest the general public um, appreciate the pieces in the museum here today? Uh, well, I'll start with your the first question, um, is that um, in the... In Europe, um, painting, art, uh, sculpture developed out of religious art. There was no art really um, before. <laughs> so that uh, the medieval paintings, I mean, this is within the religious world, right? Not going back to Greek and Roman. Um, but from the Middle Ages onward, uh, the art that was made was religious. And then it slowly opened up. Um, so that then you start having portraiture, then you start having some mythological, secular representations. And then you get still lives, landscape, genre. right? And the genre, which is neither the mythological, classical, nor the religious. So at certain periods, um, I mean, it depends what you mean by constricted, because artists always work within constraints. There are always aesthetic constraints, political constraints. Um, they might not even be aware of them. Um, but I think that what one finds then is in each period how the artists creatively are able to use the vocabulary they're inheriting from their masters, and then how they advance it um, in whatever genre or language that they are are working in. So I would say there are always restraints and that's sort of part of the challenge and beauty of art, of seeing the artists overcome these or, or work within these. Uh, for your second question, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to answer in the sense that in our period right now, there was so much information available that if you actually go online, you can get these brief, you know, histories of art. You can get these online sort of short introductions that actually, you know, were not available um, in my earlier generations. And we would have to, you know, buy maybe a survey or buy a book. But I think, you know, you can learn a lot online from many amateur sites that are that want to provide sort of accessible information about different periods. Now, I'm always going to answer both questions. Um, I think one way to look at your first question in regards to um, religion, I think another way to think about this, and I hope I did not give uh, the wrong impression from my, from my talk, that religion was such a kind of restrictive or kind of a dominant force. I mean, 
we have to think about the time that we're in, in the 17th century specifically, is that even though uh, many things are happening around the world, uh, especially for, for Europe, yeah, um, the religion was so central to life. There's no way around it. Yes, it, it, it's, it's such a pervasive kind of a force. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of capitalism today. Think about consumerism. Think about the world that we live in today, where we don't think about those things. I mean, we don't think about producing art that's, oh, that's glorifying capitalism or glorifying some kind of a, a mass media. We don't think of that because it's such a part of that uh, overall kind of a, uh, a worldview. Uh, but what I would say is that um, religion was actually dealt with in a very creative way, as hopefully that I've shown with some of the Spanish examples. And there were many, there were of course many, many Dutch examples of, uh, of this period, where they were not just painting tables or with food, there were also scenes of everyday life and uh, of, of landscape, which is also something that had a religious kind of an undertone to it, but it was not entirely about religion. So they, were, they, they managed to be creative with this idea of devotion. Um, and the object's not necessarily being devotional, but, they are, they, but there is the, the idea that they're meant to uh, be respectful towards their beliefs, yes? Uh, and there were many different ways of, of approaching that. Um, so in a way, the simple way to, to answer the question is that it was not restrictive. It's, it's, it's quite the opposite. They were able to work within that, um, they knew within that life that they had, uh, they could be creative. And this is also true in, when we're looking back at what was going on from the 21st century, is that just when we understand that religion is something that they could not be outside of, yeah, it's not kind of fish out of uh, water, then it's, um, they were quite creative with, uh, especially the 17th century with the way that uh, saints and uh, biblical stories were depicted. Uh, and I think that's kind of ties into the second question, is to think about, you know, when, when just for the general public, looking upstairs, uh, and of course we're in the part of the world where Christianity is, um, it's, part of, it's, it's part of society, but definitely not the kind of an overarching kind of a force. Uh, I think it's good to pay attention to the way that biblical figures uh, and stories and ideas of religions were portrayed during this period. Uh, I think the, the exhibition does a, a, a fantastic job at bringing all that together. I think the drama and uh, some of the, 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 the way that they, they strive for beauty as well in some of these figures uh, very much uh, is visible. So I think this is a good way of kind of for public education is to kind of think about how this show, this exhibition, uh, presents a kind of a, an entry into the Baroque period, and specifically, of course, in Italy, maybe Naples, part of the tied to Rome and Spain, uh, had that kind of a, uh, approach to, um, to, re to religious art that I think the exhibition is very good to in showing mm -hmm. for, for the public. So yes. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have any more questions from the floor? Yeah, we have one more here. Thank you. Thank you both for the presentation. They're very impressive and very informative. And I have a question for Dr. Wen is regarding the still life painting. Um, the painting that you show us is more uh, from the Dutch painters. And I know that Dutch painting, they are really good and still life. And uh, when you explain it, because we know that Dutch painting and still life painting, they are very straightforward to us. But you know, for, but for the meaning inside, and it's very in-depth and very hidden. You know, when you explain to us about, you know, the fishes and the beans and the cloth, it's all related to biblical, it's all related to Christian painting. So um, in this uh, exhibition, um, we have the Baroque painting and we have the still life painting. So uh, do you see that it's uh, two contrasts? You know, one contrast is very like open, like Baroque is very like um, very uh, related to religions. And when we walk in, um, when we see the, the the figures, the subjects, we already see know that this is a 
biblical, and then this is from the Bible, and this is uh, the Christianity painting. But for the still life, it's more subtle. And you know, when we walk in to the end of the um, exhibition, and then we will, it's a big contrast, and somehow it's quite a bit confused because you are seeing a lot of like mythology, and then suddenly you will see a very like harmony, and then like bouquet flowers, and then you know, is that a uh, uh, do, do you see this is a big contrast, you know, maybe for Dr. Frank too? Do you, do you think that this is, you know, the biblical art and then like to the still life? Is it a purpose to have this kind of like, you know, uh, open and subtle, you know, creatorial to the viewers? Thank you. Dr. Frank would like to begin first because it's more out then it's kind of outside of the still life I was talking about. Maybe you could <laughs> answer that first. I don't know. <laughs> Um, the well, I think it goes back actually to what I was saying before, that is as um, the, the themes develop that are ex available to artists uh, in Italy, you get this, this widening of content and themes and subject matter. And so in the 17th century, um, you know, some of the still lives then become Jean scenes. And this all of a sudden, you know, the interest in and the ability to paint uh, more people in everyday positions, the ability then to show your skill, um, as uh, Sim was saying, in these fantastic still lives. Some of the examples we see in the exhibition are also reflecting the development of botany and naturalism, right? So you have a whole scientific world um, that really isn't, there's, there's no time to mention everything in, in the exhibition, um, but the, the explorations of the new world and the fascination with new types of plants um, and then with classifying them and painting them um, as we heard in a very realistic way. So you can identify the tulips and the different roses that are being shown. So that there's one uh, painting of these two fantastic um, flowers whose names I cannot recall, um, but they sort of pop out at you. And you know, one of them has some, um, it doesn't put you to sleep, but it has some kind of quality to it. They're clearly rare flowers that the painter you know, is, is obsessed by or perhaps has been commissioned to paint, but it, it links to botany, right? And some of the other ones too. So they're displays of magnificence, they're displays of the artist's skill. Um, and they also are linked to scientific um, investigations so that they're a new, they're, they're relatively new genre. While we have centuries of religious art leading up that has prepared us for this content, this is something new, sometimes overlaid with religious symbolism, uh, sometimes less so, and tying more to scientific knowledge, naturalism, and display of rarity, luxury items as well. And I'll also comment on this contrast that you, you're bringing up. Uh, and uh, to think about this idea of the Baroque was actually coined much later in the 17th century. Yes, and um, it's derogatory to begin with. Yes, I mean, I think many of you, uh, mm -hmm. you understand this. So to think how when we, th uh, when we look at the Baroque, we often have these ideas about what it is. But for the most part, the works that we consider, whether it's Baroque painting, architecture, sculpture, many of these are uh, site-specific as well. Yes, these are works that have been preserved in churches, uh, in these religious sites. So they've always retained the kind of meanings because they're attached to a specific place versus some of these other paintings that Dr. Franks also uh, was just bringing up. Uh, landscapes, yes, genre painting, and some of these other more kind of everyday life kind of scenes, uh, or, or, or bouquet or other things like that. Um, these are pictures that were sold in the art market and often kept in homes of the wealthy, of the um, aristocracy or other places. And so they're not as tied to any specific site, you know, even, paintings of the, uh, that glorified the monarchy, you know, often were painted as these kind of classical mytho mythological figures that may not have as di direct a relationship between a painting of a saint or of biblical scenes inside a church, yes? So I think um, we also have to think about how we view history, 
yeah, and how it's been defined that the Baroque is a specific thing. But uh, overall, it is Thai, as we've seen uh, hopefully today in both presentations, that um, they had, everything is connected through the Northern Europe and Southern Europe, and also uh, temporarily, yes, and across time that we're looking at our late medieval paintings and sculptures that is connected to this idea of the motions of the Baroque period. So uh, I think it's, it, it, it's, it probably is the mo most helpful for us to understand that the entire idea of the Baroque is a kind of bias. And it's something that we could either see past it or at least understand the, um, the parameters, yes, the constraints of it, um, and then perhaps see things that are related so that it's not as much of a contrast necessarily, but um, there are connections that are uh, possibly center and periphery and uh, in other ways of thinking about it, but they're not necessarily opposed, yeah? I, I'm not suggesting that you're saying that, but it's, um, I think that's another way to kind of try to understand the time period and different kind of expressions of the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen and Dr. Frank. And uh, do you have any more questions today? And if not, thank you everyone for your questions. And apart from today's talk, we have also prepared a series of online programs for this exhibition. Tomorrow at 8 p.m., we will premiere an online talk program called Listen and Talk, where our music director of the exhibition, Professor Johnny Poon from Hong Kong Baptist University, will explore the art and music making inspired by Baroque paintings. If you would like to learn more about this program, please scan the QR code display on screen for more information. The recording of today's talk, as well as other programs, will be uploaded to the entertainment channel of LCSD shortly. Please stay tuned for more online programs uh, of the Road to the Baroque exhibition. And this is the end of today's talk. For our audiences here, please kindly return the completed questionnaires to our staff on your way out. You are also very much welcome to visit the exhibition in person on the second floor of our museum. Thank you very much for coming. See you next time.